Yo, 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 what's going on, guys? So we are back with another live video, just, you know, speaking off the cuff. Um, today, we're talking about music videos. And, um, you know, we've talked about music videos a lot on the channel. Now, um, I just wanted to do something live where we're covering a bunch of different topics in this video um, in regards to music videos. So, um, yeah, let's get right into it. Um, again, this is a live video. It is um, going to be... Uh, public on the channel so if you maybe can't watch the full video you can come back to the channel and if you go to my channel rose at production and you click on the live tab it will be there so you can re-watch it or you know you can watch parts of it whatever it may be so we're going to get into this today um we've got a little bit of a slideshow presentation here that i created just so you guys can uh, follow along but consider this a mini music video masterclass. so are you one of these two people? One, you binge watch Lyrical Lemonade videos, bought a starter camera, and want to film your first, your first music video. Or two, filming music videos is something you're familiar with, but you're looking for more insight on how to make your music videos look even better. Hence why I'm assuming you're watching this video. So we're going to be, you're probably one of those two people, and uh, maybe you're not a beginner. Maybe you are more of an intermediate shooter, but... You know, there might be a thing or two that you'll pick up from this video. And that's the beauty of, um, you know, these live videos and what I want to bring to this channel. You know, we touch on the beginner friendly stuff, but we also touch on experiences that I've had with any topic that we're talking about in these live stream videos. So, you know, everybody can kind of get value from these videos. So before we begin, I want to shout out my online music video course. I talk about this a lot because I truly believe in this course and I truly believe that it will help creators like yourself up your music video game and help you jump the initial learning curve. And again, even if you are an intermediate shooter, there is literally benefits for all because I offer some pretty crazy discount codes to some really big companies online, which we're going to touch on a little later on when I talk about my music video course, go a little more in depth into it. But there's over 140 music video lessons. If you want to enroll, I left a link in the comment section of this live stream or you can just click the first link that you see in the description of this video. And the course is called Learn Freelance Filmmaking. Again, over 140 music video lessons. It's the most in-depth online music video course on the internet at the most affordable rate. It's literally cheaper than every other music video course on the internet with the most amount of value. I promise you, you will not regret that purchase. And if you do, and you're not learning from it, 30 day money back guarantee. That is literally how confident I am in how valuable that online course is. Andy Shots, what's good? So I'm going to be also, because it's a live stream, there's going to be people tapping in and commenting. I am going to shout everybody out in the live stream. So we got Andy Shots. Um, much love from Uganda. Yo, that's crazy, man. I mean, we're out here in Canada right now. I'm in British Columbia in BC in a little town called Gibson's uh, for the next couple months. So I'm posted up here, creating content and uh, shooting for some clients, uh, doing some editing jobs and whatnot. So, um, you know, much love from Canada, bro. Shout out to Andy Shots. All right, let's get into it. So frame rates. Um, what should you use for filming music videos? What frame rate should you be filming? So as long as your camera shoots in 24 FPS, which literally every camera on the market shoots in 24 FPS, including cell phones, but also 60 FPS. 60 FPS is a very important frame rate to uh, to shoot with for music videos because that allows you to film slow motion footage. So 24 FPS is your regular speed clips. 60 FPS is your slow motion clips. Or you could also film performance scenes in 60 FPS. But we're going to get a little more in depth into that a little later on here or maybe actually into the next slide. Yes, setting up for the shot. So you have your camera, you're on set with an artist. How do you set up your shot properly? So this is kind of my standard operating procedures that is in the back of my mind. I've done this thousands of times now, not only on music video sets, but also corporate videos, fitness videos. It applies to all. This setting up for the shot literally applies for every single niche, not just music videos. The first thing I establish when I'm setting up for a shot is what frame rate am I going to be filming in? Am I going to film in 24 FPS? Am I going to film in 60 FPS? Am I going to film in a high variable frame rate such as 120 FPS or 180 FPS? You need to establish what frame rate you're going to film in first. So I'm going to kind of walk you guys through 
um, everything too with a couple different frame rates and just show you guys what my whole standard operating procedure is and um, the necessary steps that I would take when I am setting up a shot. So the next thing I'm going to look at is aperture, right? So you're going to set up your aperture. Are you going to shoot at f1.8 for a nice blurry background? Right now I'm shooting at f2.8 and you can see my car in the background is a little blurry. But if I was shooting at f1.8, everything would be super blurry in the background. If I'm shooting at f5.0 or f5.6, f7, you know, you're going to have less blur in the background, but you'll have a little bit of a sharper image. So you got to establish what aperture you're going to film at. Next up is shutter speed. So your shutter speed is really going to come down to what frame rate you're filming in. Is it going to be 1 over 50 shutter speed, 1 over 100, 1 over 125 if you're shooting in 60 FPS, 1 over 250 if you're shooting in 120 FPS? Your picture profile. So I always say picture profile before ISO because let's say you're filming in a natural picture profile. ISO doesn't really matter at this point, but... Um, a lot of beginners that will shoot in natural picture profiles or they'll film in, um, you know, flatter profiles that isn't quite a log, but still a little more flat than um, than natural. So you have a little more dynamic range. Um, but for myself, I always film in log. So my Canon R7, my Canon R5C, these two cameras have C log three. My old Lumix S1, my GH5, those had V log. So pretty well every camera out there will have a log setting. It, it is, generally speaking, the more medium budget to high budget cameras will have logs pre-built into the cameras. But when you are filming, let's say in C-Log3 or even on my Lumix S, or yeah, let's let's use my, my Canons as an example. So when I film a C-Log3, the best ISO to film at that will show the least amount of grain in my image will be ISO 800. So when I film in C log three on my Canon R7 or my R5C, I always film at 800 ISO. On my Lumix S1, it is recommended to film at ISO 640 to get the least amount of grain and the best, highest dynamic range. So let's say we're establishing our shot. All right, for um, let's say we're filming in 4K 24 FPS. We're going to dial in our aperture. We're going to say, okay, we're going to film at f 2.8. Next up, we're going to adjust our shutter speed. So we're filming in 24 FPS, so our shutter speed is going to sit at 1 over 50. That's what I'm going to set it to. Picture profile. I'm going to film in log, see log 3, let's say. Then my ISO, I'm going to set it to 800. Let's say we're filming on a super bright day like this. Then I'm going to toss a variable ND filter on my camera to adjust and add more shade to my image, but still be able to retain all of my manual camera settings. So next up, we have when to use 24 FPS and when to use 60 FPS. So 24 FPS is going to be literally just your regular speed clip. So what you are seeing right now is like regular speed. This is like real time speed. Um, another time that I would use 24 FPS religiously pretty much is when I'm filming handheld and gimbal scenes, even tripod scenes as well. Um, I just love shooting uh, my performance scenes or any 24 FPS shot. Um, in 24 FPS just because you get that natural motion blur. I, I think that when you film at the 1 over 50 shutter speed at 24 FPS, so we're just doubling our shutter speed to 1 over 50, you're going to get a very natural looking shot and you're going to get natural motion blur. So when I wave my camera in front of my, or my hand in front of my camera like this, you're going to notice that there is blur in between my fingers right now. Do you kind of see that? I don't know if you can see that. Let me go like this here actually really quick. Do you see like a natural motion blur when I even go like fast? So right now on my Canon R7, I'm filming. I'm going to keep doing this so you can really see it. So I'm filming at 1 over 50 shutter speed at 24 FPS. And you're getting a natural motion blur. Now, when I look at my hand here, when I'm not looking at my screen on the side here, when I look at my hand, I can't really track a clear, clear image or like sharpness on my hand when it's being waved in front of my face. And that is because I'm filming at 1 over 50 shutter speed. And so what you're seeing is what I'm seeing. So 4K, 24 FPS, doesn't have to be in 4K, but in 24 FPS at 1 over 50 shutter, you're going to get that natural motion blur. And that's why people say that when you film at 1 over 50 shutter speed in 24 FPS, you get a more cinematic feel. And it's because it looks more natural to the viewer on the other side of the screen. So 60 FPS shots. 60 FPS, of course, we all know it can be slowed down by upwards of 40% speed. So um, right now you're seeing, you know, Regular speed, if I were to slow this down by 40%, you'd probably get something more like this. So you get slow motion. Um, I always shoot my B-roll shots in 60 FPS. 
Um, so any time that I want just that slow motion, that buttery smooth slow motion that artists absolutely love, I'm going to shoot in 60 FPS at 1 over 125 shutter speed, again, doubling our shutter speed to get that slow motion, that clean slow motion. And another thing, too, is a lot of people, um, you know, this is a big thing. A big beginner mistake is filming your entire music videos in 60 FPS. Um, you know, when you start to film at 60 FPS, you are doubling your shutter speed to 1 over 125. So what ends up happening is you're losing that natural motion blur of 1 over 50. So now your entire music video doesn't really have that nice, smooth, um, natural motion blur anymore. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you may as well just, if you're filming a performance scene that doesn't require any sort of slow motion in post-production, then what's the point of filming it in 60 FPS? Just so you have the, the safety net of being able to use it as B-roll? I don't... I, I don't know. At the end of the day, I would just rather just, you know, cut the scene at the end of the performance scene in 24 FPS and then just switch to 60 FPS and shoot the same thing at 1 over 125 in 60. So um, that's kind of my mindset on music video sets. Um, another thing we have is intro cinematic. So, you know, the first 10 to 20 seconds of the song where it's just an instrumental of like a music video, um, you know, that's when you can really implement those 60 FPS B-roll shots. So when to use LUTs. So this is a really big one because I see this so many times with beginners where, where they just slap a LUT on their image and call it a day. Um, my whole process, and I still use LUTs to this day quite often actually, um, whether it's like a Rec. 709 LUT and then I start to color grade um, or, or I slap the Rec. 709 on and then I color grade after or I slap the Rec. 709 and then um, or I, I, I color grade first, color correct, and then I put a Rec. 709 LUT or a stylized LUT. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Like when I used a red Komodo back in the day when I used to own a red, I would actually use um, red's Rec. 709 LUT. And it was just a conversion LUT and it would at least give me a base to work off of. And after that, then I would do adjust everything. My, you know, my hue, my, my HSL curves, my, uh, my contrast, my saturation, all that stuff. So it kind of depends on the situation and the clip. But really when it comes down to it, um, filming in a log or um, flat picture profile. So in a flat picture profile, you're not going to really want to use a LUT. Um, it's actually going to um, oversaturate your image. It's going to over contrast it because when you film in a natural picture profile, you are kind of already shooting in a very, very um, contrasted and oversaturated um, kind of like, like picture profile. But when you're filming in log, um, yes, like, you know, you, you should be implementing LUTs, but at about 10 to 30% opacity, which we're going to touch on in a second here. So the first thing that I do, let's say when we're filming in um, a log picture profile, so like a super flat picture profile, first thing that I do is I color correct my image. Okay, so I adjust my highlights. I make sure my highlights aren't peaking. I make sure my shadows aren't crushed so that we still have detail in our darks. And then I adjust my midtones very slightly. I punch some saturation in there, potentially a little bit of contrast. And then I add either a stylized LUT or just a Rec. 709 LUT to give it a natural look. And I only set it at 10 to 30% opacity, 30% max. I think if you do anything more than that, it's just way too much. And if you do need to, to add more than 30% opacity of a LUT on your log picture profile, chances are you just haven't really color graded enough when you are actually um, color correcting your image prior to adding the LUT. Um, now, when I do have my, my look and I've added my LUT at 10 to 30% opacity, at this point, I'm going to go back into my grade and then I will start to adjust the HSL curve. So that's little, the little eyedropper in your um, color grading section where you can literally like touch on the green in the background here and I can, you know, punch some more saturation in the green, but only isolate that one color. That's when I go in and start to play around with that. Or you can desaturate different or certain colors in your image and, you know, give it a more bland and raw look. So, and uh, Andy Schott says, in a nutshell, if you get time to talk about the new S5 Mark II um, as if it's better than the Canon R7. Otherwise, thank you, my teacher. Yo, thanks, bro. So actually, we, we are going to... Um, slightly touch on the S5 Mark II, but at the end, I do have a Q&A. So if you guys want to drop your comments in the comment section, if you have any questions, literally just drop them in the comment section at the end of this live stream. Um, it's, this isn't going to be a very long video, but I'm going to answer everybody's questions very, very in-depth at the very end. 
So if you have any questions, guys, we got some viewers in here watching. If you have questions about music videos, filmmaking in general, just drop them in the comment section and I will answer them extremely in depth. So next up, we have the unwritten rules of filming music videos. Okay, so I made a video that has a decent amount of views now, I picked up some traction and it's a 50 minute video on how to shoot music videos for beginners. And I just talk about a bunch of different topics. And one of the topics was the unwritten rules of music videos and how rappers run on rapper time and how I think that's like an actual thing. And I find it funny, but a lot of people actually were commenting. They're saying, no, you need to charge for your time and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yes, you can. But at the end of the day, if you like when you this is more so for like the rap music videos when you're dealing with you know trap rappers and stuff like that like when when you hit them with a oh yeah sorry man you were t you were an hour late i'm charging you an extra hundred dollars or like what my day rate is for an hour of filming like that's not going to end very well and chances are they're probably not going to book with you again even if it is just up charging them by like a hundred bucks just because they were like super late um chances are they're not going to work with you again and that's why like you know, music videos aren't for everybody. You have to have a little bit of patience with um, rappers, in my opinion. But, um, you know, this is an actual fact. And, you know, I've been filming music videos for well over like five years. And this has happened more times than I can count. And if it's a reoccurring thing, then I know that it's just something that is uh, or that happens with just rap videos in general. I don't know about really like other niches of music videos. I don't shoot too much of that. But for rap videos, like rappers just run on rapper time. That's just a fact. And I'm sure a lot of people can um, relate to that. Um, so my experience shadowing with Logan Mice. So Logan Mice is a DP out in Los Angeles, California. I had the opportunity to actually shadow him in an Ugly God set. So um, Logan has DP'd stuff with Cole Bennett of Lyrical Lemonade. He shot with Kanye West, Dax, um, pretty much uh, like Ian Dior, like literally every big artist that you know that's a rapper. This guy's probably had some sort of involvement on set with these artists. Um, so he's a really, really talented dude. And I was shadowing him on an Ugly God set um, for a song called Batman. So I show up on set and no word of a lie, call time was like 5.30 in the morning in LA. And I had like a, probably a 45 minute drive to get to this location. And no word of a lie, I get there around 5.45, 6 a.m. Ugly God does not show up until like 9 in the morning. He was like three hours late. And, you know even though this is a really big budget music video set and there was literally so many people involved on set, nobody even seemed to care at all. So if, the, if rappers are running on rapper time in, you know, small budget music videos or free music videos, just know that they're also running late on big budget music videos. And that's why I always say like, until you are actually on a big budget music video set shadowing someone, or maybe you're involved in it, you you might end up seeing this first firsthand. And, you know, I was even chatting with Logan for that first three hours on set um, before Ugly God had shown up on set. And, you know, we were kind of laughing about it. We we're like, oh my God, like blah, blah, blah. Apparently he's, he's out buying shoes right now or getting a haircut or something. And he was just kind of laughing about it. And um, Logan told me that, um, a few weeks prior to this Ugly God set, he was actually on set with um, Cole Bennett of Lyrical Lemonade. And he said that they set up this whole location in one part of Los Angeles for Kanye West. They were shooting for Kanye West. And I think it was YMB Melly or something like that. Um, they had like a song together and they have this whole set set up. And Kanye goes, yeah, um, actually, I don't want to leave this part of L.A. I got like shit to do today. So you guys are going to have to come to like my area. So they had to literally pack their whole set. And because it's Kanye, they had to pack their whole set, move it, reset up in a completely different facility and set. And then he came to set. And it's like that is pretty extreme. But you're probably dealing with a budget of like, you know, 100, 200 grand. So it's like, yeah, you may as well pick up and do it. And, you know, for an artist that's super busy and just, you know, has other stuff going on, you know, you have to work within their schedule, which is just crazy to me to think about. You know, corporate videos definitely don't run like that. But um, that was just a pretty funny story that um, Logan was telling me about. So next up, we have camera gear recommendations. So low budget cameras that I would recommend are the Canon M50. Um, I've used this a couple of times. Great camera. Super, super affordable, even if you can find them cheap and or use. Um, both of these cameras, you can, I don't even know if you can purchase them brand new anymore. So you might have to find them used or like secondhand. Um, the Canon M50 shoots in 4K 24 FPS and 1080p 60 FPS, the two frame rates that are most important. Same goes for the Lumix G7. 
Now, the Lumix G7 doesn't have the best autofocus, so most people would more so go towards the Canon M50 over the Lumix G7 due to Canon M50 having better autofocus, but I always tell people that not having autofocus as a beginner or a camera that has good autofocus and you have to resort to manual focus, this actually excels yourself as a technical filmmaker um, but much quicker than somebody that just relies on autofocus all the time. Because let's say you continue to become a filmmaker and you make it your full-time career, and eventually you purchase like an Ursa Mini Pro or um, a Red Komodo or a cinema camera that doesn't have autofocus or lacks good autofocus, you're going to be going into that cinema camera being able to operate it pretty much like right out of the box because you're already going to be so in tune with how to properly manual focus and do it really well and quickly and efficiently. So um, that's why I always say that, you know, learning how to manual focus early on in your career is actually going to benefit you down the road. So a low to medium budget ca camera is the Canon R7, which only costs $1,500. I'm actually um, live streaming off of the Canon R7 right now. And I absolutely love this camera. This is, there's so much camera in this camera body for the price. It is actually insane. Like Canon absolutely crushed it with the Canon R7. Yes, it's a crop sensor, but it does shoot 4K up to 60 FPS and 120 FPS at 1080. It has in-body image stabilization, a flip out screen. You got those Canon colors and it does shoot in C-Log3 if you want. It's got pretty good in-body image stabilization, which I was very surprised about. Dual SD card slots. And um, yeah, there's, there's so many good things I can say about the Canon R7, mostly because of the price point. $1,500 is very, very cheap and affordable for first-time filmmakers. And um, I'm just very happy with my purchase. Uh, medium budget cameras, um, the Sony FX30 comes in at $1,800, shoots 4K up to 120 FPS, which is pretty wild. Now, this is, again, a crop sensor, not the best in low light, but still actually pretty decent because it is a Sony, and Sony does kill the low light game, um, and it does record in 10-bit. There's a lot of things that I'm leaving out here because I don't shoot with Sony, but I've done a little bit of research in the FX30, and it's a very hot camera right now. So um, that is definitely something to look into, and for the price of $1,800 US, like very, very affordable camera. Um, another medium budget would be the Lumix S5 Mark II for $2,000, just slightly under $2,000 US. Now, I made videos about how I left Lumix. I used to own the GH5, the S1. I was about to order the S1H at one point, but I didn't. I swapped to Canon, and I now own the Canon R7, which is my B cam slash vlog camera slash YouTube rig, which I'm using right now. And then I also purchased the Canon R5C, which is an absolute monster, but we're going to touch on that in a little bit here. Um, another, and, and the thing with the, with the Lumix S5 II though, is, I mean, guys, like I'm looking at these specs and they're actually pretty insane. So 4k up to 60 FPS, perfect, pretty industry standard by this point for new camera bodies hitting the market, 6k, 24 FPS, 1080p, 120 FPS, internal 10 bit, a new autofocus system, which I do believe that is probably pretty decent by this point. I think that Lumix has finally addressed their autofocus. It might not be perfect, but at least it is like actually usable at this point. And um, I must say, I will always stand by this, even though I have left Lumix. Um, the Lumix ecosystem is that Lumix has the absolute best autofocus system hands down. So... I honestly would probably recommend the camera. I would have to use it before I highly recommend it. But I think that Lumix is kind of, you know, starting to move in the right direction. So high budget cameras. So I have the Canon R5C price at $4,800 US. It's a pretty heavy investment. However, when you are getting into the more higher budget cameras, which is basically anything over the $4,000 US price point at this point, guys, like it doesn't really matter what camera ecosystem or brand you're using anymore because they all do the same thing, but they all aren't perfect. They all lack something, right? Like, for example, my R5C is literally the perfect camera. It is the perfect camera for me. It's everything that I could ever ask for in a mirrorless camera, in a higher-end mirrorless camera. But then again, we come back to, you know, cameras not being perfect. I can only get like 30 to 40 minutes of recording time or my camera being turned on before it dies, which is my Lumix S1. I could have that thing turned on for probably like six hours and it'll run like mint for like ever. My Canon R7 even has really great battery life, but the battery life on the R5C is absolutely terrible. And what it comes down to is that, you know, I I've accepted it that no camera is perfect. I could go Sony on a7S3 
or maybe an FX3, but there's going to be things that I just don't like about it. And, you know, you just have to accept that no camera is perfect. There will never be a perfect camera. Um, so the R5C does shoot up to 8K raw, 4K up to 120 FPS, shutter angle, which is really cool. So it's kind of like a nice mirrorless cinema camera hybrid. I love that it has shutter angle. It's a low light killer, unbelievable in low light. Um, Canon color science, again, is my absolute favorite. And that's a big reason why I went with Canon. High budget um, for Sony is the A7S 3 because I've just heard so many good things about the A7S 3 It shoots 4K up to 120 FPS, upwards of 16-bit RAW recording, which is pretty nasty. Um, I know a lot of people that shoot, like my homie Mario Vision shoots on the A7S 3 I believe my other homie Crackalack shoots on the A7S 3 and their visuals look absolutely stunning. And um, Sony's come a very long way with their color science too. I think that once the A7S III release, it was kind of game over. Like these guys really got their color science on lock and it looks really, really good. And by the way, guys, um, if you're tapping into the live right now, drop your any questions that you have, like any questions you have about filmmaking or music videos, drop them in the comment section. And I'm going to have a little live Q&A answering everybody's questions extremely in depth. All right, so lens recommendations for music videos. So you eventually want a tight lens, a medium focal length lens, and a wide angle lens. So starting with a tight lens, um, I recommend the 50 millimeter. Now the thing with the 50 mil is I actually don't even own a 50 mil because I just don't really care to shoot with a tight um, lens for music videos. But if you do want a tight lens, something that's affordable, the 50 millimeter nifty 50, the F1.8 Canon lens is like the go-to. Um, a medium lens, and um, this is my favorite by far, is a 35 mil focal length. So I own a Canon 35 millimeter f1.4, and it's by far my favorite lens to date. Even on my Lumix S1, I owned a Sigma 35 millimeter f1.4, and that's all I really used with my camera, to be completely honest. That was like my go-to lens. It came with me everywhere that I went. Um, they're just very versatile because it's not too wide, it's not too punched in, and as long as you have a little bit of space to work with in your environment, you can make the shot work with the 35 mil, and it just looks so sharp because of the prime. Wide angle lenses, anything between the 11 to 16 millimeter focal length. I use a Tokina 11 to 20 millimeter lens, which I'm using right now, and I absolutely love it. It's a great budget lens that's perfect for wide angle shots. I do recommend though, if you can get a prime lens such as a 16 millimeter wide angle, it's just, it's still wide. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's much more sharper than a zoom lens. Um, so prime lenses over zoom lenses. Um, my biggest beginner mistake, the first two years of filming music videos, the first two years that I ever filmed music videos, I use a Sigma 18 to 35 millimeter F1.8. Very, very um, versatile lens. It's a great lens for the price. Um, super sharp for a zoom lens. But... Um, I, I messaged somebody that I've been following for a very long time. His name's uh, Charlton Visuals on Instagram, and he creates music video content out in Toronto. And his music videos are just so sharp. And I remember way back in the day, we're talking like six, seven years ago, I was watching his videos. I'm like, how does this guy's videos look so crisp and sharp? So I messaged him on Instagram. I'm like, dude, like, what is your camera setup? And he's like, man, the secret to it is literally shooting everything off a of prime. He shot everything off of a prime lens, and that is why his images look so sharp. So that's when I invested in a Sigma 35 millimeter, and instantly, light bulb moment, I was like, wow, this is what I was missing out on for two whole years. So if you can invest in a prime lens, I would highly recommend it. They are more expensive, but worth every single penny. So what lenses to purchase first if you are looking to um, get into purchasing new lenses? I would start with a 35 mil, start right in the middle. After that, I would do a wide angle. After that, optional is a tight um, lens. Um, I got a couple questions in here um, from Critical Knits. Um, can you record music videos with the stock 90D lens? Um, short answer, which I'll go more in depth at the end of this live stream when I do the Q&A, but yes, you can film music videos off any lenses. I just dropped a music video tutorial on my channel shooting an entire music video with my cell phone and I didn't have any aftermarket lenses. I didn't use any equipment. Yes, I used one light, but other than that, it was all like native color science off the iPhone and I filmed the entire a sick looking music video with my phone. So yes, you can film with a stock 90D lens. 
handheld gimbal and tripod filming. So this is one that I would personally need to be like actually holding a gimbal, holding a camera to show you guys different techniques and be on set. However, in my online music video course, which I touched on earlier on, and I will touch on it again, because again, I'm so damn like just like passionate about this course that it can truly help you jump the learning curve as a filmmaker. There's over 140 music video lessons in there. And yes, I do have an entire camera operating section. I want to say there's about 12 to 14 videos just in the camera operating section where I go over handheld techniques, tripod techniques, gimbal techniques, how to film performance scenes properly, how to film B-roll scenes properly all about camera operating. We also have camera basics. So if you are a beginner, I have a whole basic section. Um, I have a B-roll section, performance scenes, how to edit music videos in both Final Cut Pro 10, Premiere Pro. There's a whole iPhone section. Like I literally cover everything in that course that you would ever search up on YouTube. This is just a one-stop shop and is truly the most affordable online music video course on the internet. I, I purposely undercut everybody else who's made music video courses because I truly believe that in like putting out free content on my music video channel and like helping people. However, if I'm going to be spending a thousand hours to create an online course, I should be compensated something for it. It's not that much to be completely honest, priced at $99, but it is cheaper than the other music video courses out there. And it has, I'm not even kidding you, upwards of 20 to 30 times more lessons in the course. So editing music videos. So I always recommend that you edit music videos in Final Cut Pro 10, Premiere Pro, or DaVinci Resolve. Um, repetition is everything when it comes to music videos. You know, you can you can watch YouTube videos, but just know that YouTube videos are going to just teach you a person's workflow, but not actually teach you like the ins and outs of actually editing music videos. I mean, my online course does have like a step-by-step -step process in Final Cut Pro 10 and Premiere Pro of how to edit music videos and the necessary steps you should take for effects, for importing your files, for hard drive management. But at the end of the day, when you watch free content on YouTube, it's just going to give you a good understanding of somebody else's workflow. Um, now, after you've edited about 10 to 15 music videos at this point, now I know that sounds like a lot, but when you really get into the music video game, it's really not that much, especially when you're an up and coming music videographer and you know, you're know you filming a lot of videos for free and you're just kind of getting a feel for it. 10 to 15 music videos isn't really a lot. And at that point, when you've gone through the edits for 10 to 15, even 20, that's when you start to notice that you start to have a, a stylized look and something that is more, you know, um, tailored towards you as the filmmaker and the creative. And, it, you know, you have your own touch on the actual footage itself. So how to get more clients um, as a music video director or shooter. So this is like a really funny one. And I have some tactics that have actually worked like in the past for this. Um, first is going to local shows, showing your face and showing the artist love. Um, face-to-face -face connections, especially at local shows, when you are paying for a ticket and that and a part of that ticket money or like the entire ticket cash is going back in the artist's pocket and you're there like supporting the artist, that does mean a lot to them. And showing your support like like means a lot to not only artists, but like anybody. So when you can go to a live show and the best ones to go to are the ones where it's, you know, maybe a panel of six different artists going up to perform for, you know, 20 minutes a piece. Those are the best shows to go to because then you can connect with all six, seven, eight, nine, ten of those artists after the show is done. Show them your Instagram, show them your highlight reel, connect with them. Um, that's a really smart approach to actually get clients. And I've gotten about six music video clients from doing that in my earlier days. And funny enough, I still work with those same artists to this day. And it's been about six or seven years. So um, it does work. Um, cold call DMing artists. So I always tell people before you cold call DM somebody um, like an artist, do your research a little bit. Don't just like be like, hey, you want to work? Here's my rates. Actually go to that artist's Instagram Click on the link in their bio. Chances are it's a link tree. Go to their SoundCloud or Spotify. Listen to a couple of their songs like all the way through. Hell, even skip through them. If you find a song that was really good, DM the artist and say, hey, man, I was checking out your work on SoundCloud, came across this one song, and I really liked it. I already have some ideas brewing for how we can create a really good music video for it. Do you have any music videos shot? I would love to direct a music video for you. This is a much more personal way of like reaching out to the artist and making a more personal connection, especially when you're just showing them the utmost love about their work. And when you're showing artists praise, that is like will give them 
more inclined to like actually even message you back. So um, why filming your first music video for free is a good idea. Would you pay an amateur for a service who is charging a professional rate? So what I mean by this is um, now we're going to we're going to touch on shooting music videos for free. A lot of people disagree with me on this. I think that your first two to five music videos should be free. Five seems a, a little excessive, but um, when you shoot a music video for free, you literally have no like way less stress on your shoulders because let's say you completely butcher a performance scene or a few of the performance scenes and the video doesn't come out how you envisioned it. At the end of the day, the artist didn't pay you anything for it. And if they still get something at the end of it, like, you know, it's a win win for everybody. It was a learning experience for you. And the artist at least gets a piece of content to post. So that's why I always say that shooting your first for few for free is like really smart because you you're going to make so many mistakes like and no matter what, even if you get into real estate videography and you shoot your first few, you're going to make mistakes. That is just the name of the game. You're getting into it. You're still an amateur in this space. So. I always say too that like, would I hire, would you hire an accountant? Let's say you just started a business, okay? Would you hire an accountant who has never actually ran books for somebody or gone to school for accounting or fully understand accounting and has maybe only watched YouTube tutorials on it to run your books for your business, but also charge you a rate that a professional would charge? Like, why would you go with that person if they don't have experience in it? It's the same thing with music videos. And a lot of people fail to realize that. They just think like, oh, music videos are, you know, filming videos is just such a hot thing right now. And, you know, you should, creators need to get paid for their time. But if you're an amateur, like, why would you go out and pay for a product or a service from somebody else in a completely different area? It could be anything. And pay full price for something that is a subpar average piece of content or like, or service. That's how I look at it. I think that your first few music videos should be for free. When you do produce a music video for a client, upload the music video to your YouTube channel, start a YouTube channel, brand it under whatever your personal brand is or your business's brand and post to YouTube, Instagram and Facebook page. More eyes on your work, the better. Why just stop at Instagram? Also post to YouTube and Facebook. Again, it's just more views and more eyes on your work. So again, guys, we're going to touch on my music video course. I got two options for my course. You can purchase the full course, which is over 140 music video lessons at $99. Or you can just purchase my cell phone course. Maybe you're a cell phone shooter. I also broke it apart into a $27 course. Um, so it's a lower ticket course. It's super affordable, very easy to consume. There's only 11 modules in the cell phone course. But if you do want to go all in and learn music videos the right way and become a pro much quicker by jumping the learning curve, you're going to want to invest in my $99 music video course. I stand by it. It's a 30 day money back guarantee. If you just don't like the learning process in that course, um, if you want to try it out for free, I have about eight lessons that I gave out just free of charge. And if you click the link down in the description, you can, you know, get into the free course and just see how my learning style is. You will see how in depth I go on my online music video course in the free course. So imagine those eight videos, how in depth I'm going in those eight free videos that I'm giving you. Multiply that by, you know, you're going to have 140 if you purchase the full course. Plus, over time, I will be adding to the course. It is a one time fee for lifetime access. So there are brand partners when you do enroll in my online music video course and there's heavy partners like this isn't like a bullshit course guys like straight up. Um, this is like a, a pretty serious course that I put a lot of time and effort into. I've spent over well over a thousand hours to produce this course um, and still don't charge nearly enough money. A lot of people call me crazy for only charging $99. But the exclusive discount codes you're going to get are going to be for prop movie money. I believe it's a 15% discount code. June Tech one of the biggest gimbal providers on the market. You get a 10% discount code to select June Tech products, 15% discount code to Moment. If you're a cell phone shooter, you can purchase discounted um, lenses for your iPhone or your Android. Uh, Tropic Color, we got a 15% discount code. Motion VFX, a 15% discount code for any sort of like effects that you want to purchase. And a 50%, 50, 50, 50% discount code to Rolls at Production, my online shop. All right, guys. So we got a Q&A session here. So we're going to go through if you guys, um, this is the last call. If you guys want to drop any questions in the comment section, I'm going to be going through for the next little bit and just doing extremely in-depth 
um, Q and A's here as you guys are used to. If you used to tap into my live streams when I did it more often, if you guys have any questions, comment in the live stream box and I'm going to answer them extremely in depth. So starting with the first one here, in a nutshell, if you get time to talk about the new Lumix S5 Mark II, um, is it better than the Canon R7? Um, that's a tough one because they're priced. So the Canon R7 is about $500 cheaper than the S5 Mark II. Now, it's so tough because I believe the S5 Mark II is a full frame camera. So it's probably going to be better in low light. Um, it does shoot in vlog, um, has a flip out screen. It's basically an S5 on steroids. It has a new autofocus system. Um, and what else does it have? It shoots 6K 24 FPS, I believe. And it also shoots 4K up to 60. So looking at the specs, I think that it would actually be better than the Canon R7, just specs wise. Now, this is another thing to you guys, like when we're comparing like camera bodies, I personally think that especially like, you know, that's only a $500 difference. And like the specs aren't too, too different. In my opinion, if I gave a absolute beginner amateur a, an S5 Mark II Lumix and I was using a Canon R7 and we had the same focal length lens, I think that I, I would produce a much higher quality image and video than the amateur using the S5 Mark II. So it really comes down to like how comfortable you are using your camera. Like right now, um, you know, I've only used my Canon R5C maybe like a handful of times. I just haven't had opportunities to shoot too much content right now because I'm doing a lot of editing at the moment. But, um, you know, I'm still learning the camera and an experienced R5C shooter would outshoot me any day, even though we have the exact same camera body, like if that makes sense. So it really does come down to who's actually camera operating, not so much the specs. A lot of people get very hung up in the specs, but it does come down to like the actual camera operator and how much skill that camera operator has. Um, Daddy-O says, yo, what's up, bro? It's good to see you back in the live here, man. You're always tapping in OG to the live stream and to the channel. Um, Daddy-O says, uh, being forced to learn manual focus on my older camera was so valuable to me. I still use manual focus 50% of the time, even on my A7S III. That is such a good point. So we did touch on that in this video about manual focus and how important it is for beginners to be using manual focus, even if it isn't 100% of the time and it is 50% of the time, like Daddio says, like even you know an experienced shooter using an A7S III is literally still using manual focus 50% of the time. And I would say that I'm the same way. On my Canon R5C, my R7, I use manual focus about 50% of the time, I would say. Maybe even more, maybe 60, it's a 60 40 split. I use manual focus quite a bit because I just have full control and I don't have to worry about any sort of camera error of, you know, autofocus hunting or anything. When I'm shooting something like this, yes, I'm going to put autofocus on because I'm not going to sit here and try to punch in my manual focus. That doesn't make sense. For a YouTube video, I'm going to shoot an autofocus. For a music video, I might go back and forth from autofocus to manual. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, is the Canon 90D good for making music videos? Again, we touched on this, but like any and oh, um, Critical Knight said, um, can you record music videos with a stock 90D lens? So first off, um, the 90D is good enough. Like I said, I literally shot a music video recently that I made a tutorial on on the channel. You can check it out on shooting a music video with a cell phone. I shot it with my literally this phone right here, this camera right here. Um, I'm going to go to my full screen. So um, I literally shot an entire music video with my cell phone and it turned out fire. In my opinion, it looked way better than even like super amateur music videos that were shot on like higher end cameras, but were camera operated by, by an amateur. So um, it really comes down to your lighting, your camera angles, composition, and who is actually behind the camera. Um, and you can shoot with a stock 90D lens because in that iPhone music video, I shot with the lens right here, literally this one right here. So um, yes, you can. Um, where can you find prime lenses? So prime lenses can be purchased on any camera shop. BH Photo will have them. A prime lens would be anything like a 16 millimeter, 25 millimeter, 35, 50, anything that doesn't zoom. So a zoom lens would be something like an 18 to 35 millimeter that can zoom from 18 to 35 and everything in between. Um, so prime lenses, yeah, they can be purchased literally at any camera shop um, you can think of. Um, Premiere or DaVinci? I would say DaVinci Resolve, personally. I think that DaVinci Resolve is industry standard. It's super next level. Like, there are color grading movies, short films, 
Um, literally, the biggest movies that you see in theaters are probably color graded in DaVinci Resolve, not in Premiere Pro. Um, DaVinci Resolve, in my opinion, I always call it a precision editor. Now, there is ways to make your editing time a lot quicker in DaVinci Resolve. But for me personally, I'm very slow in DaVinci compared to Final Cut Pro 10. If I'm just cutting like a simple, simple client video, I'm going to use Final Cut. If I'm doing more of like a higher budget video, like a corporate commercial, something, you know, that's in the 5,000 plus range, I'm going to edit it in DaVinci Resolve because of the color grading capabilities. And I feel that when you're editing raw footage um, and log footage in DaVinci Resolve, there's just the color grading capabilities are absolutely next level. So I would say DaVinci Resolve over Premiere Pro, though. I think that DaVinci uh, takes a cake there. Yo, CFW is good, bro happening into the live another og let's go um daddy o has another question here best way to break past the 300 dollars mark for music videos or the best way to target higher paying clients all my current clients are in the beginner and amateur space so i always think or i always tell people the exact same thing that it's like stop going for the clients that are you know the beginner and am or in the beginner and amateur space a lot of people will get stuck shooting for beginners or amateurs that don't have a lot of budget in the music video space because they are targeting those people. You need to start reaching out to artists that are just simply bigger, artists that have management, people that you know are actually taking it very seriously and treat it as a job. Um, you know, the same goes for corporate clients too. Like you know. I could go and target a small business and shoot a $750 video for them, like a little brand video or something or a walkthrough video of their business. But, you know, they're not going to want to pay me $5,000 or $10,000 for a corporate commercial because they just don't have that cash flow. That's just not in their cards. They can't, they simply cannot afford that. Like they literally cannot afford that. But if I target a company or set up a meeting with a company, that is making millions of dollars every year, and I know that because you can tell which companies are making a lot of money, then I'm gonna pitch them on you know, a $10,000 video package. And to them, they're like, well, you know, we can afford that. That's in our marketing budget. They actually have marketing budget. So I think that it's more so just trying to target um, more established artists and really making an effort to reach out and find people that are more established and taking the craft of music videos more seriously than somebody that just wants to flex on, you know, Instagram. Um, the other thing too, is obviously like investing in more gear. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, the second you buy a really expensive light or new lens, you can now charge more money, but it is going to up your image quality and the higher the image quality of your videos, the more that will actually naturally organically attract um, just better clients that are willing to pay more money. Um, another thing too is just being okay. This is the last thing and then I'll get to the next question, but um, is being okay with turning people away because when you keep accepting $300 video clients or less than that for budget wise, um, you just keep attracting more of those people. And, you know, people do talk too. you know, with an, when one artist books you for $300, they go to their friend and say, you should book with daddy. Oh man. He like, he charged, <laughs> charged me 300 bucks. Like what a steal. So if you start to turn away the $300 budgets and you start to, um, you know, um, just quote people, start quoting people $500. I, I dare you to start quoting your next 10 people that hit you up for $500 and you will see that at least a few people will bite. But even though you lost out on the 10 videos for $300 and maybe you only get three videos for $500, that is a step in the right direction for slowly upping your budgets. Because when you film those three videos for 500 now maybe the next one is going to be 650 and you keep upping that until you get to a point where either people just aren't booking you anymore because your budgets are too high or um yeah that's, that's pretty much it actually just like honestly keep creeping them up until people stop booking with you because they just can't justify the price at that point you either have to go for the high high budget clients or you need to start to you know rethink about your budget and maybe lower it back again or start to invest more money into equipment like such as cinema standard equipment to start getting into those thousands of thousands of dollars of um budgets um 
Another thing too, guys, if you are looking to like get into higher budget music videos, something that a lot of creators overlook all the time is finding artists that are actively seeking grants. Um, where I live in the province that I live, there is a lot of um, music video grants going around, especially this year. And I think there's upwards of like there is a few like multi million dollars of grants going out to artists in the artist field just in our province alone. And there are artists left, right, and center that are applying for these grants. And some of these grants are for like ten to twenty thousand dollar budgets for music videos. And you know they're just getting these grants. The artist doesn't have to pay for it out of pocket. And now you know you can actually get paid what you're worth plus way more. So that's another thing too. Look into you know artists that are actually actively seeking grants because um, that's how the artist will be completely fine with paying you your full rate. Um, Ari or Red. I've never used an Ari. I've only used a red Komodo and I've kind of played around with a red Gemini before, but just because I've only used, well, because I've only used red, I would say red, but I, I believe that Ari Alexa, um, Ari Alexas, I've seen footage of those are comparison videos compared to like reds and high end reds. I just like the Ari Alexa way more. I think that Ari is goaded personally. I've never used one, but I've just seen test footage and it looks absolutely amazing. Um, what is manual focus? I wasn't here for the beginning of the live. Sorry if that's a dumb question. So uh, Critical Night, this live stream is actually going to be placed publicly on my channel. So you can actually rewatch this entire video if you'd like or skip through to the part where I was talking about manual focus. Um, but manual focus is basically where you have to manually pull your focus. So it's not autofocus. Autofocus will do the focusing for you. It does all the work for you. Manual focus is literally where you get to um, just adjust it completely manually. You can punch the focus really far away. You can bring it really close like to where this mic is. Um, you have full control over it. Now, the issue with that is that you have to be on top of it the entire time you're shooting. Whereas with autofocus, it does the work for you. Now, you might just say, well, why don't I just shoot autofocus the entire time? Well, because you can get autofocus hunting. You might not be focused on the thing that you want to be focused on. The camera's trying to focus on the things they think you want to focus on, but it might not be what you want to actually focus on. So that's why a lot of people shoot manual focus. Um, CFW, do you have off seasons or months when there isn't much work? What do you do for money if so? So um, yeah, that's a really freaking good question, actually. So um, off season for us in Canada, where I live in Canada, I live in Saskatchewan in the prairies. Now we get very cold weather um, in the prairies. You're probably like, what the hell are you talking about? Look at your background. Are you on a green screen? I'm actually right now in British Columbia in a small town called Gibson's on the Sunshine Coast. You can see the mountains in the background here. And where am I? You can see the ocean. Oh, everything's right here. This is literally the ocean water. I'm very close to the water. <laughs> it's in a really beautiful part. And um, the reason why I came out here, um, we left uh, me and my girlfriend, I believe early January is the first week of January. And we're here until probably middle of March or end of March. And the reason being is because in you know the last two weeks of December, you have to think of it this way. The last two weeks of December, business owners, even artists, they're, you know, they're getting ready for um, Christmas. They're purchasing Christmas presents. They don't have budgets to be spending on video. So that last two weeks of December really is like pretty dead. And then January, you know, people are just getting back into the swing. The first two weeks of January, they're getting back into the swing. You know, they're back to work after the holidays, back to running their businesses. And then because back home, it's so cold outside. Like right now, apparently we're getting some sort of like winter vortex or something. So it's like, I looked at the weather today. It was minus 25 degrees Celsius before wind chill. So with wind chill, it's probably minus 30, minus 35. And who wants to be filming content in minus 30 weather? Like nobody wants to film content minus 30. So right now, January and February are like the coldest months of the year where I live. So for me, being out here, I mean, is like, look at the weather outside. It's not like this every day. It rains a lot. But like today, we have a beautiful, beautiful day. I could go film content for a client like outside, like right now in my t-shirt. I was literally having my coffee outside in a t-shirt. So um, what I do for money in the off seasons, um, it's not so much like, you know, I do prepare for the off seasons for like the end of December and into January and half of February. Um, you know, I go cr like over time, over time, over time for the first, you know, for like November and December, I work like very hard to make up for the lost um, clients and money in 
um, you know, end of December and into January and a little bit into February. So I do prepare for it. I know that it's coming. So I do work extra hard to make more money for those months. Um, but, you know, me being somebody that's like, okay, like I do realize that there are some months that might be less revenue than others. So that is why I created an online course. That's why I am tapping into the e-learning space. It is money that I can make some days while I sleep. Like I woke up to a few course sales, like, and I'm not saying this in a cocky way by any means, you know, I had to work extremely hard and unpaid. It has not paid. It's like, I've not paid off the amount of time that I put into the course yet um, just with sales so far because I put in about a thousand hours into the course to create it in literally three months. So um, I haven't made my money back yet, but I mean, it is cool that, you know, right now I'm not shooting videos, I'm editing videos, but I woke up to three course sales and it's like, that is kind of the reason why um, I created the online courses. So not only can I make money on top of like, let's say I'm on a shoot and I make two course sales while I'm making money on a shoot, you know, that's just added revenue. Or maybe I'm just not shooting video one day and I'm working on other stuff like for my business, but I make a couple course sales. Um, you know, that's money that I can just make passively. And, you know, I have an online shop. I do affiliate marketing, right? I review products, but I ask the companies to gift me the product so I get to keep it, but they give me an affiliate link. Um, I have Amazon affiliate links. Um, I have affiliate links for Epidemic Sounds. Like I make money in a bunch of different areas. I also have another business. So I have my video production company. I have my e-learning space company where I sell courses. I have my online shop, affiliate marketing. Plus, I'm a part owner of, um, of an online hockey goaltending development program. So that makes money you know, every month too. So, and like, I'm a part owner of that. So, um, that is how I'm kind of making money. I dabble in a lot of different things because let's say if video production isn't doing well one month, at least I, I'm not even kidding. I just listed them. I have five other sources of revenue that are making money while this one isn't, but then, you know, the next month, maybe my affiliate links don't do that well, but I'm shooting $20,000 worth of video content. Like, that so you know there's always this like back and forth but at least i have some sort of stability and it's funny too because a lot of people is listening to a podcast and like people talk about like job stability and like oh like being a filmmaker there's not much stability but it's like depending on the angle you take at filmmaking like for what i'm doing i would say that affiliate marketing is actually more stable than a full-time job at like a government job or not a government job just a full-time job you can get laid off at any point. Look what happened with COVID. Overnight people, thousands, tens of thousands of people were getting laid off. That's not very much job like stability. But it's funny because during COVID, when all these people are getting laid off from their work and their jobs, I'm still getting my affiliate marketing checks. And if anything, they've, you know, they're making the exact same amount of money as it did the month before the entire world shut down. So that's how I look at <laughs> that, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, is Final Cut Pro the best? I wouldn't say so. I say that it comes down to whatever um, program you actually want to um, become invested in. I'm Final Cut Pro 10 works for me because I've been using it for about a decade, literally like 10 years now. Um, and I'm extremely fast at editing in Final Cut Pro 10, faster than majority of people, in my opinion, um, that are at my level and skill. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's not the best for color grading. So that's why I do some things in DaVinci Resolve if I do want to go ham on the color grading. Um, there is no best editing program. I think that DaVinci Resolve is definitely up there. But at the end of the day, Final Cut Pro 10, Premiere Pro, DaVinci Resolve are all great platforms to um, look into. Um, we're going to do a few more questions and we're going to um, tap off of here. So do you realistically think music videos are something you could live off shooting full time? What are some other avenues of money making in that space? Um, okay, so I realistically do think that you could make a living off of shooting music videos depending on where you live. If you in a, live in a small city like myself with 300,000 people, <sighs> tough. It is tough. You can do it, but it's tough. And I know somebody in the city next to us, about a two hour drive in the same province who does actually make a living off of shooting music videos. Granted that he is, like I mentioned, he's working with artists that are getting big grants such as $10,000, $20,000 grants, and he's working with those budgets. So he can make a living off of it in a smaller city. Um, it took him a long time to get to the skill set that he's at, but he does make a living off of it. It probably took him a lot of time and effort, but he can do it. His, um, his name is Dylan. He's at a, a company called Versa Films. Um, very, very talented director and DP. 
Um, now, if you live in a place like Los Angeles, dude, I could move to out Los Angeles and make a living off of music videos like tomorrow, like straight up. Um, now, what are some other avenues of money making in that space? Do you mean in music videos? Um, if so, I mean, you could do like photography shoots with artists. You could start to tap into just photo shoots. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to just be charging somebody for a music video. You can charge, you can upsell for an extra $75, like 20, 20 edited photos for the artist to use on their Instagram or, um, you know, cover art and stuff like that. Um, you know, there's all little like upsells that you can do. You can purchase things like prop movie money. And, you know, if an artist wants to use prop movie money on set, you can upsell them by 50 bucks. You're like, yeah, sure. You can use this prop for the full day, but it's going to cost you an extra $50. And, you know, you can you can make extra money in little upsells like that um, very easily. Um, another thing, too, is like my friend Mario Visions. I mean, this is this took him a very long time to do and, you know, to come to this conclusion. But um, you know, he opened up um, studios to cater to music artists. And, you know, he's been very, very successful in that space. I talked to Mario quite often about it. And, um, you know, he was shooting music videos. He started with shooting free music videos and then $200 music videos, $400 music videos, now into the thousands. But then he realized, what's the point? Like, how do I make music videos more passive? So he opened up studios in Los Angeles. And I believe he just opened up his third studio or maybe has two either two or three studios and he's, he's been very successful with it and that's a way that he's now making passive income off of other people shooting music videos so it's not even him shooting the music videos as much anymore um now that's something that's a big investment but if if mario did it like seeing how where he came from in the music video game anybody can get to that level and all he did was just stay true to himself and shoot the best content for music video wise that he could do um Prime Duo says, what's the best way to keep consistent lighting settings outdoor and indoor? Adjust shutter or ISO. For instance, I'm shooting log subject at, um, okay, one, one over exposed as we move around, et cetera. It changes and it's hard for me to adjust. Um, that's a pretty loaded question. At about the 20 minute mark in this live stream, I would actually refer back to that. I actually talk about how I I. Had, I um, set up for the shot. So look for that slide. It's it's a slide that's in here, and it's called setting up for the shot. Um, I would I would rewatch that. That's a pretty loaded question um, of how to set up. But at the end of the day, if you're shooting outdoors, you're going to want a variable and D filter. So I'm going to use this for example. Um, this image you're seeing right now. So. The first thing I did was I established my frame rate, 24 FPS, I'm live streaming. Obviously, 24 FPS, I set my shutter speed to 1 over 50. So 24 multiplied by 2, 1 over 50. I'm shooting in a natural picture profile right now. I don't want to shoot in a log because I'm live streaming. So I sat at about half a stop overexposed, and I'm shooting at about 400 ISO right now. If I were to be shooting in log, I would shoot at 800 ISO, and then I would be one full stop overexposed like you are um, saying in your uh, message there. Now, the next thing I did was I actually exposed for this background. It looks a little overexposed. That's just because the R7 doesn't have the best dynamic range. If I was using my Canon R5C, this would be perfect like perfectly exposed in the background. But what I did was I actually exposed for my background here. And then I sat in my chair and I started adjusting my key light to brighten my face. So what this is doing is I'm actually creating a high dynamic range look shooting in a natural picture profile but like look at the dynamic range it's it's faking good dynamic range because you can see everything in the background you can see you can see the mountains you can see the water the ocean you can see the trees the grass even my car but i'm still shooting in a natural picture profile i'm just cheating high dynamic range because i expose for the background i made sure the background was maybe half a stop overexposed so you could see everything and you can even see the blue sky and i haven't even color graded this is just a natural clip and then i just added my key light here to brighten myself up so that's just a way to cheat high dynamic range and you know how i set up my live streaming shot just now uh last question do you think editing or learning vfx is a good way to diversify your income when you aren't getting shoots yes and no i think that um VFX is definitely something that will take over over time, but um, I, I I don't know. There's still there's still room for just like traditional filmmaking and videography. Um, I think personally that like I, I've thought about getting into VFX, but for me it's like okay, well I'm gonna have to probably invest a good you know two thousand hours, three thousand hours of my time over a year to actually get really good at it to the point where I could charge pretty good money for it. 
why would I not just invest that time and effort into building my brand or building another online course? I think that there's just better ways for me personally. Maybe that's just me, but I think there's better ways to use your time. And I think that if you just hop on the bandwagon, all of a sudden, you know, you're just jumping into the group of every other filmmaker and what they think is going to be the next big thing. So now you're in a group of like, you're in a saturated market again, right? You're just going from one saturated market to another, in my opinion. Yeah, VFX might not be as saturated, but it still is very saturated. And VFX, in my opinion, is um, it's a very niche thing. Not every artist actually wants that. Not every client wants that. And I think it's very niche specific. So like, I don't think that knowing how to do really good VFX and crazy, crazy VFX will help you that much with like corporate work, personally. And that's where the money's at, too. That's where the money is at for is corporate work. So um, if you want to tap into like other things, VFX doesn't really come into play too, too much. It does a little bit, but not not too much. Like for me, I would rather use a thousand hours to literally create another huge online course um, because, you know, that's just another source of passive income. And it's not something that I actually have to get a client for. I just have to sell somebody through my ads or through organically through my YouTube channel. So that's how I see it. I think that, um, and, and the other thing too is like, you know, tapping into online courses. The reason why I did it is because, like, how many creators do you guys personally know that have online courses that aren't like, you know, Parker Wallback? Like, Parker Wallback out of the picture, those big guys out of the picture. How many just average ass filmmakers do you know that actually have online courses that are marketing them? It's probably not that many. Maybe it may be 1%. So, I would rather get into an untapped market like that that is less neat, like less saturated. Personally, I think there's just more, more money in that type of an industry. So, Zeus, greetings. Uh, sorry for the late tune in. No worries. How long does it take to edit videos? Loaded question, man. Like that could be. Sometimes it's an hour. Sometimes it's thirty minutes. Other times it's twelve hours. Really depends on the video. Dwayne Bowens was yeah, lighting for the win, bro. Hey, good to see you, man. I hope Adam's doing well as, or doing well as well. Um, hope you guys are doing good, man. Long time no talk. Thanks for tuning in here. So guys, we're going to end this live stream. We're a little over an hour. We had some really good questions in here. I hope you guys enjoyed this little mini masterclass. And I hope you guys learned something in this video. And if you guys want to um, want me to hop on here and do another slideshow presentation for something else, maybe it doesn't have to be music videos. You know, leave a comment down below on this video. Let me know what you guys want to see next on these live chats. Um, I am making this public. So if you want to go back and listen, um, you know, you can do so and you can skip around whatever. You can listen to it as kind of like a podcast in the background and, you know, learn more about filmmaking. So with all that being said, guys, thank you everybody for watching. Again, if you guys want to purchase my online music video course, click the first link you see in the description down below. You will not regret it. And if you do regret your purchase, I have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So um, that's how confident I am that you will love the course and take in so much valuable information. So guys, thank you so much for tapping in. Yes, more of these. I already have somebody saying that I should make more of these, which I will. And I'll make these um, totally public for you guys to go back and watch because they are definitely a little more lengthy. But again, guys, thank you so much for tapping in. Love the live stream community that we have on the channel. You guys are absolutely fucking amazing. Mind my language, but seriously, you guys hype me up. And, um, you know, it's the first thing that I've done today. And, um, you know, this totally set the mood and my vibe for today. So I'm going to go shoot some YouTube content and I will catch you guys in the next video. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. Later.